Welcome to this tutorial we are going to do today on the structure of DNA, the building block of life, the stuff that separates you from an apple and uh, various other things as well. In this video we'll have a look at the basic structure at the start and then go into a bit more detail toward the end. Okay, so with DNA the first thing we'll want to know is that it is comprised of nucleotides. And these nucleotides have four possible bases. These bases are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And I'll put a picture of what the chemical structure of each one of these bases looks like. So here we have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine straight away noticing that adenine and guanine look almost identical and thymine and cytosine look almost identical as well. And what we are going to do is refer to adenine and guanine as purine bases and we call them purine bases because they contain two rings. A pyrimidine ring which is six-sided and a a mitosol ring which is five-sided. So pyrimidine ring has six sides and the amidazole ring has five sides. And noticing in the structure as well that I put N in a few places. This is uh, for nitrogen and that's why they call them nitrogenous bases. Now when it comes to thymine and cytosine, we can see that they don't have that second ring structure. They only have the six-membered ring structure. And we just said uh, with adenine and guanine that that six-membered ring structure was called a pyrimidine ring. So we will refer to thymine and cytosine as pyrimidine bases. So they only have that pyrimidine ring, which is six-sided. Okay, so that is our bases covered, but what about the rest of the DNA structure? Well, we call it deoxyribonucleic acid, and we don't call it that just to make things confusing. It actually means something. So deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Now the DNA is going to be made of three separate units the nitrogenous bases, which we just discussed, a pentose sugar, pentose meaning five, so pent, you can think of pentagon, and lastly, a phosphate group. So let's see what this looks like. So here we have our phosphate component of DNA and attaching to the phosphate or bonding to the phosphate, we're going to have our deoxyribose and we call it deoxy because a regular ribose would have another oxygen here. So we have one oxygen here and when the other is missing it is deoxy and we can also see that it is a pentose or five-membered ring. And lastly we have our nitrogenous base, in this case being adenine. This is our DNA, our individual unit of DNA. But that structure is far too complex, so just for the majority of the rest of this video, let's give them all a simple kind of shape. So we'll give the adenine and guanine these shapes, and the thymine and cytosine will give a complementary shape. And we're going to give them a complementary shape because we refer to these bases as complementary bases. And if I put up a strand of DNA here, the structure we all know, the double helix of DNA. So let's just write that down quickly. DNA double helix. And if we zoom in to our DNA just a little bit closer to get a better look at all the individual components, First, we're going to see the backbone. And the backbone of the DNA has these alternating blue and orange segments. The blue 
are signifying our deoxyribose and the orange signifying our phosphate. So we have a sugar phosphate backbone. So DNA is going to have a sugar phosphate backbone. Remember that. And another extremely important feature of DNA that we need to know, so we'll write it down right now, is that it is anti-parallel. Anti-parallel meaning that the two strands are parallel to each other, but they run in opposite directions. So one strand runs upward while the other runs down. Now let's just draw a few of our bases in this DNA helix using the shapes that we drew just a moment ago. So we have adenine and thymine, and we're also going to have guanine and cytosine. So we can see that these shapes fit each other. They're going to fit. This is why we call them complementary bases. So wherever we have an A on the DNA strand, we're going to need to have a T to accompany it on the other side. And this goes for our G's and C's as well. So wherever we have a G, we're going to need a C on the other DNA strand. So all A's need to bind to T's and all C's need to bind to G's. So I've just drawn a few more bases in there so we get an idea of what the DNA is going to look like. And our bases aren't just going to bond to each other through a wishful thinking alone. They need the help of something called hydrogen bonds. So I will draw a uh, green line where our bases meet to signify hydrogen bonds. So we can see a few hydrogen bonds here. Now, if we zoom into the molecular structure of our DNA, we're going to see why this hydrogen bonding is so important. Now, what we'll see is that it is the reason why our bases are complementary bases. So I'll just clear up some room there. And we can see here our two strands opposite each other with these hydrogen bonds. So the bases, adenine and thymine in this case, bonding through hydrogen bonds. And A's bond to T's through two hydrogen bonds. But C's are going to bind to G's through three hydrogen bonds. And before I show you the structure of our cytosine binding to guanine, I'll just quickly digress for a moment to show you exactly what we call these individual units. So the base or the nitrogenous base is just simply called that. But when we have our deoxyribose binding to the base, we call it a nucleoside. Now when we have this whole entire structure, base, deoxyribose and phosphate, that's when we refer to it as the nucleotide. The nucleotides, like we already mentioned, being our structural units of DNA. Okay, so we've got our cytosine and guanine up here now, and the three hydrogen bonds that will join the bases at the middle. But our backbone needs to be stabilized as well, otherwise we're just going to kind of have these strands freely rotating around the hydrogen bonds, right? So our phosphate is going to bond to the three and five prime carbons of our deoxyribose. And this is why we refer to our strands as having a three and five prime side. So we can see this bond here between phosphate and deoxyribose. And if we look on the right hand side, we can see that actually that deoxyribose and uh, phosphate and nucleotide are upside down. That's because they're anti-parallel. So running in opposite directions to each other, but why do we call it a three and five prime end? That's referring to our deoxyribose. So our deoxyribose has five carbons, naming from one to five, one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime here. 
So the direction in which our deoxyribose is facing will determine what we call that end of the strand. So our five prime carbon we will call the five prime end if that five prime carbon is the last carbon at the top. But if our three prime carbon is the closest to the end of the strand down here, we're going to call it our three prime end. So our strands have a five and three prime end. And if they are anti-parallel, that means they're going to be reversed. So on this other strand, we're going to have the three prime end at the top and the five prime end at the base. And knowing the difference between your three and five prime end is going to be very important when we begin to talk about DNA replication. So once again, these strands are anti-parallel to each other. And I know this looks very complex, but just remember that that is simply a zoomed in version of the DNA double helix here. And if you're wanting to know why the helix actually wraps around like that, it's simply due to the way in which these bonds interact with each other. And that covers all of the basics we'll need to know about the structure of DNA. I hope this video has been helpful to you. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.